Pottier, and I lead the business and general aviation and integrated systems businesses for GE Aviation. So the business general aviation is the engine side. Those are all the engines that are not uh, designed for commercial transport or specifically for military applications. So it's all of your general aviation, business, crop dusters, medevac, training, business jets, turboprops, small, small uh, regional utility aircraft, that sort of thing. And then the rest of it is the integrated systems, which are all the businesses, all the products that GE Aviation uh, designs and manufactures that are not engines, for which we have a very large portfolio. Um, with the exception of avionics, our avionics business is, is uh, led by a gentleman named Alan Kozlovka, and that's separate because it's a, a, uh, there's a joint venture with, with China on avionics. So those, those are the two pieces. So as, uh, as Rick mentioned in, in uh, 2008, I was asked to form a business and general aviation business for GE Aviation. Up to that time, we had, um, our, we had a few applications in business aviation, but they were really derivatives of engines that were used in regional uh, aircraft. Uh, we did have a joint venture that was underway with Honda on the GE Honda for a small turbofan, but our, our business was you know, less like $100 million or less. It was less than $100 million in 2008 in the business general aviation space. Um, and we thought that we could bring technology from the commercial engines. We have this concept that GE called the GE Store, where other businesses and uh, divisions and product lines, we are free to pick and use technology from different parts of GE and, and put that into, into products to bring more value to customers. And we thought that would be a great opportunity to do that in this marketplace where we really didn't have much of a presence. We had almost no presence. Um, so uh, we, we launched this thing really with, uh, with acquiring a business in the Czech Republic called Walter Engines. It was a very small, uh, Eastern European turboprop manufacturer. It was a legacy of the uh, of the Soviet occupation between 1968 and 1989, when the Walter engine was was really developed. Um, and we wanted to get into that business so that we could learn the marketplace and gain some domain expertise, and ultimately be in a position to offer a product to compete with Pratt and Whitney Canada and the PT6, which. Um, is really a legendary uh, achievement for, for Pratt. That engine is, was first introduced, I think, in 1964, certified in 64. They delivered like 50,000 of them. Virtually all the light turboprops have the PT6. So if you can do something, if you can take on Pratt and the PT6, you're really doing something. Um, they've done a great job in. Uh, creating a huge portfolio of products. Hey, huge portfolio of products, and we'd like to do the same thing. So, um, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the about the engine that that we were selected uh, last year by Textron for a single engine turboprop. Um, there was a competition between all the all the engine manufacturers. Ultimately, it came down to three of us. It was Honeywell, Pratt, and GE went out in, you know, to Wichita for a final negotiation and we emerged as the selected engine. Um, and this engine is unique for this marketplace. It has more technology for this space than has ever been done before for the, this type of engine. Um, it has the highest pressure ratio. Our pressure ratio is uh, 16 to 1 versus the competition that's in the eight to 10 range. Um, we have variable stator vanes like we have on some of our, com our commercial engines. Um, it has a, a uh, full authority digital engine control that not only controls the engine, but also the propeller pitch and speed. So today, if you go, if you go out and you fly a, uh, a King Air, for example, each engine has three levers. The pilot has to monitor gauges to make sure he doesn't over temp or over speed or over torque the engine. Um, there's no uh, engine control and it's, you have to be 
you have to be diligent to make sure that you operate the engine properly. In this case, when a pilot when the pilot sits in this cockpit for the first time, it's going to look like he's sitting in a jet. It has one lever. It's basically a thrust lever. And we take care of, we not only control the engine, we also control the uh, propeller speed and pitch, so essentially it's a thrust, uh, thrust uh, machine. Um, because we have higher pressure ratios, we have a lot more power at altitude. So we have 10% more power at altitude than the, uh, the existing engines, and we have significantly better fuel burn. We're down 20% uh, less on fuel burn, and in small aircraft, that's a big deal because it could be one additional person or maybe some additional baggage and that sort of thing. Um, and there's a picture of it uh, of it here. We have the engine is being sized for. Um, 850 to 1650 shaft horsepower. The actual core uh, power is about 2000. And um, uh, this is Paul Corkery. Paul is leading the whole ATP program. And uh, Paul is in, uh, uh, is based in Turin, Italy, because this is a European engine, which is another first for GE. Walter engine or the H80 engine that we developed in GE Aviation Check. Yes, that it was a European engine, but that was a derivative of an existing type uh, of an existing engine. This engine is uh, is being designed, developed, tested, and it will be manufactured in Europe, which is first for GE. We do have a joint venture with with uh, Saffron Snakma on the CFM. So somebody could say, yeah, but the CFM 56 or the Leaf, that has a European, that's true. But uh, Saffron does the European certification aspects of it. We do, GE does the US. This is the first pure GE European engine. And um, so uh, we actually have in Europe, GE Aviation, we, we have almost 12,000 employees. So, and in fact, a lot of the design work and the test um, and manufacturing of products for GE Aviation are done, it is done in Europe today. We have design centers, Paul can go into a little bit more in detail for you, um, but we have design centers that are designing parts that are used in our commercial engines. And those design centers are outside the United States, many of them in Europe. So this was an opportunity for us to take the knowledge base and the expertise in engine design uh, that we have built up over the decades and now put the system and the actual overall engine design and development in Europe and leverage all those resources that uh, we have in Europe. So if you look at this sheet, um, Paul, you want to go through kind of... Yeah, first of all, good morning. My name is Paul Corkery. I'm responsible for this program. And to echo what Brad said, uh, we're thrilled to win this and honored by Textron. And as soon as you go through the thrilling stage, then you got to figure out how to deliver it, right? So that's that's the stage we're in. And one of the... Uh, this is a new centerline engine, just uh, make that clear out of the gate. Uh, Brad mentioned some of the, the features around this, the, the better fuel consumption by specific fuel consumption, about 15%, 33% uh, time between overhaul increase, 10% power, more power at altitude. Some of those things are all in the, the briefing package here. But what I wanna talk about is after we are thrilled to win this, we're off executing. And what we did was we looked across the region to find the capability. One of the toughest things when you're doing an advanced machine like this is having that capability existing in the time frame that you need it. So when it came down to it, we looked across Europe. So this is, as Brad said, one of our first European centric uh, developments on an engine, uh, mainly in Poland, Italy, and the Czech Republic. Why did we pick those countries? It's around capability. That, that's in place uh, and as Brad mentioned there's 12,000 employees so we need to define where the capability existed so in Italy for example the capability is around power turbines combustors gearboxes those types of things in Poland it's around rotating machinery 
and then the Czech Republic, it's around final test assembly and certification. So we quickly ramped up. So we're up to about 400 engineers working on the program across Europe to deliver to our customer uh, per their time frame. A little bit on where we're at in the program. We're, we're moving, since I mentioned it's a new center line, we're moving through detailed design phase right now. So we expect to have our first engine up and running and start testing uh, end of next year, fourth quarter of next year. Uh, and we'll move forward with that, with um, having the engine certified by 2020. So that in uh, engine terms, that's a very quick development cycle. Uh, so we're, we're fully staffed and we're, we're executing at this point. So it, first, first deliveries would be 2020 with the, uh, with the text drive aircraft? Uh, well, we, we, we let the airframer yeah, yeah, say yeah, when yeah. their airplane is going to deliver. Yep. Yeah, okay. But we'll be certified. But you'll, yeah. you'll, 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 you'll be ready for them at that point. We'll anyway. be ready to go. We're ready. So we'll talk okay. in terms of the, yeah. the engine. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. What's the initial rating that you're targeting? Uh, uh, it'd be around 1,300 chapters. About. Okay. Yeah. We'll have a mock-up uh, of the engine at the EAA convention in two weeks. No. I'll be there. Yeah. Okay. Well, you'll um, so um, this is a really dumb question, but when you talk about 2,000 shaft horsepower thermo thermodynamic, thermo, thermo. What, what does that mean? So. I gave you shaft horsepower. So one is, it, we look at it in two different segments. One is thermal horsepower and one is shaft horsepower. And it really has to do with how we analyze the machine at, at both altitude and on the ground. So normally the airframer is looking at it from shaft horsepower. So when the question was asked, we said 1300 shaft horsepower. Sure. But there's additional capability that we look at in terms of thermal horsepower as we analyze the machine. So, so thermal is the, is the amount of horsepower that the core can generate, okay, on the ground at sea level, right? So at your max temps and all that, it's, it's capable of around 2,000. Um, with, as the engines climb and the air pressure drops, the amount of horsepower that the engine can make decreases. Right. Okay. So uh, uh, we have a core that can produce 2,000, roughly. And then we can we have uh, a planning a family, just like our competitor has a family. So we are looking at the different gearboxes, different ratings between the uh, 850, 1650. We have a family of all those. Um, and um, the 1650 is, is the rating on the ground. The shaft horsepower we could use what's also on the ground. But the 2000 thermodynamic, I mean, I guess that suggests that it has uh, greater power than what you're assigning to it for application, so that improves durability and... Well, yes, I would say the answer that, is, that is true. That is true. There is a, an inherent efficiency of, our, of this engine because of the higher pressure ratio than, a, than the competition engine. So we lose because we have a higher pressure ratio. We can hold the pressure and hold the horsepower higher. Okay. So uh, it, it's you, you really can't when you're comparing to, unless you get into the details of what's the pressure ratio, what's the efficiency of your low pressure turbine, and all this other stuff. It's hard to translate what's my thermo into how much power I make at altitude. Okay. Right. But people always ask us, what's the thermodynamic horsepower? So we said, well, we'll tell them it's now. <laughs> but okay. the, the, the airframe, airframer is concerned about the shaft horsepower, right. and they're concerned about, okay, well, how much do I have at altitude? How much do I lose in power as I climb? Right. Okay. And we lose less because instead of having a pressure ratio of nine or 10 to one, our pressure ratio is 16. The pressure ratio on the Passport engine that, we're, that we certified for the global 7,000, 8,000, that's a whole nother new center line engine that we've developed in, in the, the business general aviation portfolio. That has a 22 to one pressure right. ratio, okay? But 16 to one is pretty high, is high for this type of machine yeah, yeah. in this market, in this right. market. 
Um, could you detail a little bit more which technologies from commercial yeah. engines? Sure. Okay. So if you go to the last, yeah, but, uh, I don't the last a... page here. Here you go. I got more coming. I think there's one on technology here. Yeah, so. No, no, no. So, um, so I'll, I'll kick it off. <coughs> the, I, we like acronyms, so you see it says high OPR, that's overall pressure ratio. If, just as a uh, high OPR, OPR, overall pressure ratio of compressors. So in order to have a high pressure ratio compressor operate at sea level, at low speed, high speed, high altitude, we have what are called variable stator vanes. So there are vanes that guide the air into the different stages of the compressor. We have those on our commercial and military engines. GE invented those on the J79 for the F4 Phantom. That was the first application of variable stator vanes back in the 60s. And all of our engines today have variable stator vanes. These turboprops in this uh, marketplace, the PT6, for example, they don't have variable stator vanes. Okay? And you need a, you need to do it effect effectively, you have to have a digital engine control to change and guide, adjust those vanes throughout the flight envelope. So that's one big technology pull down from commercial into here. The second one, is, and we have over a billion hours, we have 1.3 billion flight hours on variable stator vanes. So this is not like we're inventing something. The next big one is uh, cool turbine blades. So we take air and we route the air through the blade, the high pressure turbine blades, and to cool them. That allows you to run the engine hotter. So we, so we can maintain the, the, we can control the temperature of the turbine blades so that they're, you know, they, they, they don't melt basically. Um, we do this on our commercial engines, commercial military engines. We have cool turbine blades on the Passport engine for the Global. Um, the competition does not have cool turbine blades in their uh, turboprop, in the PT6 turboprop. So that's a big one. That improves your efficiency. We also have multi, uh, um, We also have this uh, engine con and propeller control. So um, this is a full authority digital engine and propeller control. Um, the competitive machine is a mechanical control. It, has, it does not have a digital engine control. So that's another biggie. Um, and then the other is the is a small engine architecture. This is a picture of the T seven hundred or or uh, uh, CT seven engine, which is a small uh, small engine. The T seven hundred is used in the Apache and Black Hawk helicopters, and CT seven is on some small regionals like the Saab three hundred and forty. And so, how you put all this together in a, in a small package, efficiency, bearing supports, and all that sort of stuff, we pulled that learning and that experience from our commercial and military down, in, down into here. The other thing that's not on this chart um, is we have more stages in the high, pre in the, uh, high pressure and low pressure turbine. Yeah, maybe a picture okay. can help and I can summarize what Brad was saying. I apologize for pointing. But so up in the compressor area, there's five there's four axial stages in the centrifugal stage. And what Brad talked about is variable geometry, which means that we can vary how much airflow is going in there at different operating conditions. So we're actually varying it. So that helps us achieve the 16 to one pressure ratio that drives the efficiency of the engine. So you can see that up, up here in the compressor area. So as you go beyond the compressor, you get to the combustor, and then you get to the high pressure turbine. One of the areas he talked about was how we cool the turbine. Again, we can, we can run the, say, the turbine in a hotter temperature as we move forward. So that's two stages. 
so that's bigger than normal. And then the power turbine, which actually is moving the prop, which is down here, is three stages, and you can see the three stages right there. So, that, so those are some of the differences, and to reiterate what Brad said on the integrated control system, it's the first one. Uh-oh, that's my kid's stuff. That's the launch customer. <laughs> <laughs> now I don't know how to fix it, but I can, okay. uh, I can go from there. That's, this is the first time I've uh, used AirPlay. Normally I have a hard code, but I'll talk keep going on in this thing but uh, as we move forward and you go down you have the prop which is variable and then you have the engine that's my kid <laughs> the, the prop and the engine uh, controlled from the same platform as so as the platform gathers the data from those and as he mentioned you have one lever it gives us the opportunity to collect more a lot more, more data what's happening to the engine what's happening with the prop so when we gather that data, we can do a lot more analytics around that data. So the new, the new uh, Thetic, as we call it, integrated prop engine control, creates a whole lot of versatility that, that's not out there today in terms of capturing engine, how you can operate the engine, and how you can analyze what's happening to the engine. Just, just a question, because all this technology is quite expensive. How do you manage uh, the cost of the engine to be competitive uh, in front of a PT6? That's what he asked me. <laughs> That's a great question. Yeah. No, at the end of the day, we're looking for cost and weight and delivery to our customer, yeah. right? Because weight is an important thing, but also containing cost. And when you're doing a new centerline engine, you have a lot of new technology yeah. in there. That's what we're bringing. So as Brad said, when we looked across uh, our capability, is, is having the engineers that have the experience. That's why I mentioned the three countries. We have a lot of experience in those three countries. And, and one of the, you can't describe how important the engineering team is to this, right? To be able to have that experience so you control cost. Otherwise, your costs can escalate very quick because you get into a redesign cycle. And as you get into a redesign cycle, it drives cost, it drives schedule. So one of the things we're confident about is that that fundamental base of capability that we have across Europe mm -hmm. that we can deliver our, on our customer on time. So engineering is really what ties the control and the cost yeah. is having that capability. And, and, and I'll just say that while this is a, a major step of technology infusion into this yeah. into the small marketplace, it is not all the latest expensive technology that we have in like the LEAP or the GD9X yeah. or those things. There are no ceramics matrix composites on here, for example. Yeah, but it's uh, a cooled uh, turbine blend. It's more expensive uh, than non-cooled uh, turbine blend, um, which is... Uh, it is, and that's, again, that's a, the challenging part of the engineering and the capability and having the right people on this. So. We could never go out and hire this capability quickly enough to deliver. That's why we said in, in Italy, we took their core competency and leveraged it, which was combustors, gearboxes, power turbines. Then we went to our shop in, in Poland, which is rotating machinery in the Czech Republic for all that reason. So we, yeah. we had the capability to design these components, even though we have existing knowledge in a lot of these areas we still got to develop that new center line and that's how you do it with having capable people engineers on the job yeah. but we control it very closely we have a lot of design reviews program reviews to ensure that we're meeting the customer schedule ensure we're meeting their performance and meeting all of our internal ct fuse as well and we make millions of cool blades today yeah. and it's quite automated uh, and so do they cost more than a non cool blade? Yes. Are they, uh, for these size of blades, or these are not huge blades, yeah. these are little tiny blades, right? So everything kind of scales. Um, we've got, uh, I, I look at the cost and, and we're, that's not a problem. <laughs> cool blades are not the problem. Okay. <laughs> With the data you're gathering, are, are you anticipating that will affect uh, time between hop sections and are you looking at, Great at down the road maybe be. doing any predictive yep. kind of maintenance? You're saying all the right things, right? Which is the more data you have, the more closer you understand how the mach machine is operating. You know, one of the ideas is you collect data and you validate data, you could potentially move out the time between overall.
and that that that's why that data is important so you can do the analytics around that to, to prove that that's the case so some some would be operated in a different environment than others and we can also collect that data and then we can understand on an individual basis what's happening to that machine. That's very important. So today, if you look at the way these machines in this space are are maintained, they have a uh, maintenance and overhaul manual that has basically one set of instructions that everybody follows. There is no, very little, if any, real-time data that's gathered on this, uh, on these in this marketplace so when we can now collect all the data and we can transmit it and we can get it we wind up we, we have the opportunity like we're doing on the commercial engines to create a digital twin of your serial number airplane so we can look at your plane and see how is it being flown relative to the fleet, relative to the manual, and ultimately we'd like to get to where it's, it's an on-condition type of a maintenance program, As a, ultimately. There are some regulatory hurdles and things that you have to cross to get there, um, but we're making progress on that up on our commercial engines where we are extracting enough data that we can now convince the regulators that we have enough information, we can compare it to, to the manuals and to other engines, and we can direct maintenance specific to the serial number of engine or to the operator. So I think we're all at the start of the whole digital industrial transformation. GE is out ahead of everybody, I believe, on that. Um, from the things I've seen, what we're doing on the on our commercial commercial engines, and then that'll feed right into this marketplace, which is another example of pulling from the GE store. Some other part of GE, of GE Aviation spends the money, the big money, to develop the the technology, and then it's essentially free for us to apply it in this space, if it makes sense. Yeah. So that control system gives us the visibility and. To what's happening in the engine and collecting that data in a way that you couldn't do in, in the current market. Right. Do you have any questions? Uh, is the engine being drawn to European metric standards? Will that be a first for GE? First for GE to do metric? Yeah. It, no, it's not. No, so it's the H75 not. and the H80 naturally were metric engines, weren't they? I believe so. Because they yeah. inherited it from, sure. from Walter. Sure. So this will be this will be metric. Yeah. And it's produced in Europe, so it's going to align with the metric system in Europe. Is that, is that different to other GE engines? I'm guessing, I'm guessing they're all AM, aren't they? Aren't they all I don't know the answer to that question. I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't know that it's... <laughs> I can get back to you on that. Yeah. Well, the other thing I can tell you in Europe, we're on the metric system. system. I mean, yeah. we're aligned with that. The fit for fit things, but that's the Volta sure. and Droids, yeah. I think. Yeah. Sure. Well, what's the scope for a turbo shaft um, using this core? We, we, we have, we have, you can imagine that once we introduce and people know that we're doing this engine, we have a lot of people asking us for different applications, not only just business, but also military applications, and which involve turbo prop, turbo shaft, tractor configuration, pusher configuration. So our intent is to have a family of engines very similar to what our competitor has been able to do over the last 50 years, ultimately. Yeah, but our, number our one first one application, one. and we're all focused, is on this next on our turbo turbo. Right. Laser focus. Laser focus on delivering to our customer, and right. uh, we are actually getting a lot of uh, inquiries around this, because it is a new technology, it is a new center line and a new market, but our number one focus is to our, our customer. How about, how about maintenance costs for this engine? Uh, you've got a, you've got a few extra parts if you're going to a multi-stage turbine. Does uh, more parts mean more cost, or is this uh, is, does your technology so, compensate for that and get you a lower overall cost? So a couple of things, uh, and you mentioned the number of parts. We're using additive in a lot of these, and what what additive does it gives us ability to do two things: reduce the number of parts because you can integrate it. 
um, which takes down complexity. And number two, it reduces weight. Um, so that's one of the ways we're managing that and, and around the question of time between overhauls and, and the life cycle costs. We, we have targets there and that's part of the process that we're using to manage those overall costs. But we're reducing complexity of this and the number of parts they're using out of it. Okay. And Does that and answer your question? Yeah, I'll just add when you look at the historic maintenance costs of small turbo crops out there, it's not just the overhaul. There's the hot section inspections, which in many cases turn out to hot section part replacement is not just inspection, right? That gets eliminated here. Um, so overall it's it's competitive and we had to we that was part of the negotiation with with Textron is because they're they want value for their customer sure. and they want to make sure that this is uh, uh, affordable and a step forward so that's all part of the equation right from the design right yeah is the PTC some target uh, for maintenance cost or you, your target is below the PTC cost So is, a, is, the, is the question? Is the question what's our target? No, is is your uh, maintenance cost target is a, the current PT6 uh, maintenance cost or your target is below? Uh, oh, below the spec. Below. Yeah, yeah below. below. And, oh, yeah. and we yeah. do that partly by increasing the time between overhauls. So we're looking at the okay. whole life cycle cost right. of the engine because it, that's what the end user is looking for. So those are all taken into account. It's 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 really an overall equation, not a one little piece, right? So we're looking at total cost of ownership, and that breaks down the time between overhauls and the things that, that Brad mentioned. Required what inspections, the inspections. Number of oil changes, I mean, mm -hmm. all that stuff. All that stuff. So you, were, you mentioned earlier kind of the geographic footprint in Europe. There was, so Avio is doing the power turbine and the combustor and something else, I think. So, so Avio is gearboxes. Uh, and then Poland is doing the rotating machinery. Yeah. And then uh, Prague is doing final test certification activities. Yeah. Test and say uh, final assembly final cert assembly. certification. Yeah. And then um, are any other big pieces of it coming from other parts of Europe or say land? No, those are the main the main uh, subsystem suppliers. And then right now we're looking. We haven't decided exactly where we're going to put our our final. Uh, shop but we're leaning towards the Czech Republic because we have the capability there but that's not determined but all the subsystem parts would end up in, in the final assembly and a test in, in that location. What do you mean by final shop? Where, where you're putting the ultimate engine together and testing it and delivering it to right. the customer. Final assembly plan. Yeah, the final, <coughs> final assembly plan. Yeah. That's so an interesting it, question but, because you've already made a, a new factory in Czech Republic. We, we have an existing, he, he mentioned we, existing new factory. We, we, Walter and one. Yeah, and we've made significant uh, investments and we've built up that capability over the last eight years. But there's so like, that's likely to be another, there's likely to be another building there, isn't there? Well, we, it, we're we going to overgrow the capability of that building at some yeah. point. So yeah, we're, so we're it, trying to look into the future, determine where the capacity uh, outgrows the current building, and then we'd have to put it into a new so, uh, infrastructure. I think I'm, I'm just confused, but I, I thought you said that, that you were putting final assembly in Prague, but but you haven't decided that you're going to We're do leaning that. towards it. Leaning I mean, to because us. we have the capability there today, we haven't made the final decision. Right. We're leaning in that direction based on our existing capability and country today. Would, would it be in Europe? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. 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 Okay. That, that's yes. an absolute. Yes. yes. Right. What is in Poland? Sorry, I forgot about that acquisition. EDC. EDC. Okay. Is that the, that's the name that, of that, it? That, that's, okay. that's our code name for Poland. EDC. Okay. Oh. What does that stand for? <laughs> <laughs> I got to get to look at my chart. Oh, okay. there there go. I got to look at my chart, too. Engineering, engineering yeah. Design Center. There, there you go. go. I was going to say it's our engineering it's center. It's a GE <laughs> aviation <laughs> facility in Poland. It's got 1,800 engineers. There you go. These are the brand new that's color coded. That's the Rosetta Stone. Now I have brand new color coded. Oh, wow. Just to contain enthusiasm. Development. You got a supplier or a yeah. design in mind? Dowdy. Um, 
Can we talk about the propellant? Is that the it's, it's Macaulay, isn't it's, it? Price, it's, they, it's it's the you'd have to talk to our customer. They, 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 they have said it. It's yeah. Macaulay. It's the, they, they own it. So. They do. Yeah. Okay. Um, the other in this market segment, you know, it's really in the in historically have been dominated by uh, twin engine turboprops. But is it is it is it would it be fair to say that this technology that's coming into the market now is turning trans transforming that segment into a single engine application? Well, I think they're going to be twin versions of. I mean, they're going to be twin airplanes with, hopefully, at some point <laughs> with the engine. Um, it is not just for you know a single. Uh, I, I I don't I don't. I don't know that the single is going to take over the twin. I mean, twins have okay. more capacity, size, and all that sort of stuff. That'd be a good question to ask Textron. I, I, well, and I then uh, what, what do you think about the, that market in general, single engine turboprops, uh, and they, just the, the general aviation market for that for that kind of application? How big is it, and where is it going? Because that's a big question. Well, right now you've got you've got uh, a couple of people. Well, a number of people that manufacture single-engine turboprops, right? You've got Piper, yeah. you've got Pilatus, PC-12, you've got the TVM. Mm -hmm. um, I guess those are the big three. Yeah. Three, right? And and then this one. And this, the, the thing is, it's a good question because the airplane that Textron is designing to utilize all of this efficiency and power is going to be a step up from what's out there today right it's not taking an existing you know fuselage or tube and just putting a new engine in it it's a whole new airplane so depending on how that airplane the capability of the plane is and because we have so much more capability in the engine i'm assuming that the airplane is going to be significant step up from what's available today um, I think you're gonna you're, you're gonna see people uh, it's gonna be extremely well received I know they tell us that they're getting a lot of a lot of inquiries before they've even shown the plane right and as a single in, single single uh, uh, engine pilot myself I like the single engine turbo. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to ask how, how downscalable is this how downscalable to get something into a general aviation or single pilot. Well, 850, this yeah. is 850 horsepower is the bottom. Yeah, let's say the shaft tour horsepower range. There's a point where you don't want to scale down, but we looked at 800 to about 1600. I'm, but is this family and realistically in the future, are there any hopes for this migrating down to something sort of in the top end of what would be an owner flown? Single yeah, below yeah. the yeah, I, I, I think range. this. I think this. The Textron single engine turboprop is going to. A lot of them are going to be owner flown. But I, for, uh, shaft horsepower wise, I mean, what when you say there's a limit below, you don't want to go. Well, th this th th this goes to 850. Right. Are the H series that we have out mm -hmm. of the Czech Republic, which oh by the way, we will hopefully by NBAA, we will have the single engine, the single lever power control will be certified. All the flight testing is done. That's not really the topic of this of this meeting, but we have a lot of developments that are going on. The H series out of the Czech Republic. Uh, we already have applications uh, for the single lever control on the H series engine. The H series engine goes from about 600 horsepower up to 850, so it fits underneath this. Yeah, so we look at this as a, a portfolio, right. Right? right? So from 600 to 800, you'd use the H, and right. then above that. Well, right. Would it be possible to get to the two to 300 shaft horsepower? Does that become like just because the physics? We're not going down that low. Yeah, it's, okay. yeah we're not. Is it physically possible? Oh, it's physically possible, but it's probably not affordable. Yeah, okay. that's, And the yeah. other issue is that you get down in those small airplanes, and uh, weight becomes critical. And a while this is a super efficient turboprop, it is not as efficient as a piston engine down in that 300 horsepower range. So we picked that range mm -hmm. around where the optimization would mm -hmm. be and where the market is. Mm -hmm. And we see below that 
us if the H series ends up below that, we're not really in. Right. So if you're competing against, let's say, PC6 on the PC12, you've already got owner operators, but you're also people like Royal Flying Doctor Service going into remote areas. Right. I mean, you're putting very advanced technology into the sector market where okay. it ends up doing unusual things in other places. So, I mean, is there a what is there a not well, a risk exactly? But um, not really. I mean, there is something you have to look at. I'm not saying there's no risk, but this engine here, T700, that's a Black Hawk helicopter. It flies in the desert. It flies into worse places than the PT than the PC12, mm -hmm. and so this has particle separators and all, and different types of engineering designs to make it um, capable of operating in even harsher environments than the existing PT-6. Yeah, well, it was and so some of that Part of the yeah, analytics but, but it's, got a military, it's got a military maintenance organization behind it. That, that's what I'm thinking, whereas potentially you've got with this engine, someone operating in a remote place. I mean, just the product support, getting spares there in sure. hurry. Yeah, um, it's, it's that's all part of it. Sure, and that's and that's that's the power actually of the control system and being able to look at the data and the analytics. So okay. if they're running it in a harsh environment, it's gonna it's gonna take your TVO down. Yeah. Right. Okay. So that's why we're really excited around the integrated control system, so we can look at that and optimize around special yeah. mission application. But, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the support side. So. In 2008, I said that we started this business general aviation group in, uh, division in 2008, um, and there's an industry-wide survey of product support. And in 2008, GE was ranked second to last in product support, and we, I, which is obviously not where we want to be. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, uh, we have been working and putting in programs and and open up service stations and all that sort of thing and have been climbing up and last year we were ranked number one in uh, in uh, product support by uh, uh, the ProPilot magazine, their their operator, sur their readership survey. Um, product support was a very important part of the decision that Textron made when they selected us and so we had to uh, obviously step up the game as you're saying these airplanes are operated in even more remote air areas than jets um, and but that's all part of it okay. yeah you know you're right do you anticipate uh, appro European approval for single engine IFR uh, uh, quickly after introduction and how about ETOPS operations ETOPS so, yeah but I don't think this thing is gonna fly far enough to that, well, I think get an ETOPS <laughs> rating but yeah, I think, I think <laughs> your, your, your competitor has it on one in fact I think your competitor's boss is flying a uh, a TBM across the ocean on his way home tomorrow okay uh, but uh, I don't know that um, they need an ETOPS rating though, for that. yeah yeah but yeah. Uh, it's just one of those uh, one, of the, one of those things yeah so what was it I, I'm sorry uh, whether, whether you would get an ETOPS rating on this engine eventually for the for the flights. I don't think we have ETOPS in the it's, it's in the not budget, in do our, we? <laughs> no, no, it's not in our view, but you know, we, we're determined by our customer, right? Yeah. So and that has not come up at all. Okay. But I'm not sure in the future it might come up, but they're the ones that understand the market. I mean you need ETOPS for commercial operations, right? right? Uh, and you know, extended twin operating, extended twin operating, ETOPS. So yeah. this is an ESOP. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. three hundred and thirty minute tops out of the box for it. Um, <laughs> the uh, so GE is also working on the GE three thousand, you know, just above this, and this goes up to sixteen fifty or two thousand. Is there any interest in filling that gap eventually? I mean, Brett Winnie's talked about doing that too, going up to two thousand to three thousand in that segment. We don't have. I, we haven't seen the demand for that, right. uh, no. so we're not. We're we, not we've got. We, I'm aware of. I mean, we we are we have the GE uh, GE 38 or the CPX 38, it's called for a regional aircraft. Yeah. That's up in the 5,000 yeah. plus horsepower yeah. range. Uh, so your question is, what are we doing up? Two What's the next step up? Haven't this? seen any. If there's demand, demand there. if there's enough demand for a business case, we'll take a look at it. But not at this point. Not at this point. Would you expect to push the PT6 off any platforms in the future? Any aircraft? Would you aim to supplant the PT6 in some of its current applications? 
That would be nice. <laughs> well, it's, got, it's got dozens of applications of EV6. Well, they've got more than dozens. <laughs> yeah, they are already on the C90. Yeah, yeah. 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 seems 120, I think. Yeah. I saw that yeah. you'd yeah. expect to really? do something about yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if if we can put a business case together, and and if our engine can extract, a, you know, can provide more value to their customers, so we'd be interested in doing yeah. that. Next generation King Air, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Re can you refresh some of the H80 family with some of the technology that will flow out of this eventually? Or? Some of the H80, some of the stuff we've done in H80 has flowed into this. Yeah. Okay. Good. And vice versa. Yeah. Yeah, right. and so vice we're, we're tied very closely from yeah. an engineering team, what's going on. The teams collaborate. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, he mentioned the controllers, sync yeah. whatever. So we're making sure that uh, the teams are closely aligned. They're co-located in okay. a lot of cases. Yeah, we, we have, I mean, people in Prague. At, at the, so you've been to the, yeah, right? No, no. Okay. I, I can't, um, um, people in that facility are on the ATP team. Yeah. And the person that runs GE Aviation Check, Norm Baker, he's on all the ATP calls. He's right. part of the group. Mm -hmm. um, it's ultimately, a, it's an extension of that family, right? right. So we're moving, yeah. we're moving up so that we don't look at it as two teams; it's one right. team. Right. So once this is complete and certified, there will be a GE Aviation turboprop business, which will include the H series and the ATP. They're not. You know, but be kept separate. There, what's the name of the engine? Is it, is right now, we're turbo calling turbo. it the Advanced Turbo Prop. Okay. Right. So we, stay we, tuned. We, <laughs> 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 rumors of a 93 number. Le right. Leonardo was already taken. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> Do not. It is not GE93. Okay. There yeah. is no GE93. Okay. It's just a file name. <laughs> it's, a, it's a file name. There seems to be a, a robust kind of aftermarket re engineering. Is that a market you've looked at and, and have off to the world, et cetera? Something you have interest in? Yeah, the picture. Yeah. We have yeah. done some re-engineering with the H80 engine. Mm -hmm. um, this, with this, because this is a single lever control, it would require changing the the cockpit. Uh, you know, it, there's there's more. We're not making a mechanical controlled version of this. Okay, mm -hmm. so I think that it would be a more substantial conversion than. Uh, like what we do with the H series, which we have, which is a mechanical control, a conventional control, and now we have a single lever control. Mm -hmm. But uh, we didn't. Uh, we certainly would entertain it, and if there's a business case, it would make sense. But I think it's going to be a more difficult business case. The H H is something less than a fabric controlled engine, isn't it? It's got a sort of halfway house on some control. It's a digital engine control. It's not a, it's not a, right, it has a mechanical backup, backup system. That's correct. Not full of four. You were, look puzzled by my last comment? No, 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 <laughs> I, we, I was more puzzled by the noise, weird yeah. noises coming out. <laughs> 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 I got automatically connected yeah. to the media center. He mentioned the 93 and the just went haywire. Brian, you've been great. great, I just, I don't know, are we kind of wrapped? How's your time? I don't want to, I know you got people waiting on you, so I just. Who's the 